After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story, one of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Well, folks, this is the third episode of The Path Taken. I hope that you have enjoyed the first two. I know I have. I enjoyed working on them. I enjoyed listening to them after the fact. They're just good stuff. But today's our third episode, and we are talking about Steve Gallagher. We are Tom and Alton, Alton and Tom, however you want to do it. Hi, folks. And um, Steve, well, if you probably learned this already, but Steve is a big part of Tom's life, especially in the early the early stages of his music career. Um, So he's one of those half two guys, half two people like Tanya was. Absolutely. And uh, uh, Steve is not going to be with us uh, uh, today. Uh, First of all, he's got a job that keeps him busy uh, over 12 hours a day. And he's, uh, he's like, his life is not his own right now. And also he's, he's not, this is not his bailiwick. This is not the thing that he does best. He doesn't really uh, get into public conversations. Uh, so I, I told him, I said, okay, man, uh, you're off the hook and you're going to have to, you know, <laughs> you're going to have to rely on me to try and get the story straight. But uh, uh, he's comfortable with that. So we'll miss him. But uh, this is a story that needs to be told. So uh, I think, uh, you know, starting off uh, uh, with our personal history, uh, or at least the early days would be a great thing to do. Well, Okay personal history how did you guys meet because i think people are a little familiar with the you know when you got to college and all that but how did that relationship start well actually steve was uh, a really close friend uh, uh for a long time with my older brother woody uh they uh, you know they went to tech at the on the same year uh, both of them were in five-year plans uh woody was in a, a, a co-op program and steve was in uh, the program for architecture which is a five-year program at tech at least he was in that at the time and so I really didn't know Steve when I was in high school. Uh, Woody and Steve hung out together, especially when they knew that they were going to tech together. But, you know, once we actually got to school, I'm not really exactly sure how our, our paths actually crossed, except for the possibility of the common denominator of music. Uh, all of Steve's brothers went to tech. And uh, they all his father was incredibly smart in, in the long term. What he did was when his first son went to tech, he bought a trailer and put it on a trailer lot that was about three or four blocks from campus. And as all the other guys uh, in his family actually went up there, they all lived in the trailer. So basically, they didn't have to pay any any rent, and uh, so there's no room and board uh, costs, at that, and saved them a ton of money. It really and, did. You know, oh, <laughs> Jesus, it's amazing how much. And so I got into it uh, with Steve, uh, making trips over to the trailer and, and playing and stuff like that from time to time until we actually saw that there's – there's something really nice going on here. Um, and eventually, at, uh, for a short period of time, I lived with him at the trailer. And we, of course, really immersed ourselves into, into big-time music experimentation. But the trailer was a, was a really big part of the beginning because uh, it allowed Steve all, not only to have to worry about uh, uh, you know, rent and stuff like that, but also allowed uh, the privacy and seclusion that we needed if we wanted to crank up the stereo or or get into a recording session that certainly an apartment or a dorm wouldn't provide. Right, right. So that that was the, that was the, the start of it all. I didn't even know that. It's just like so. His entire family went to tech, including y'all. Absolutely. Well, the thing is, he has five brothers or okay. four brothers and himself. Um, two of them, no, three of them went on wrestling scholarships. And, uh, they, you know, that wrestling was the sport for, all, for, for most of the brothers. And, uh, uh, they were all very academically sound. Uh, each one of them had a different major, but they, you know, tech just was the, the natural point to gravitate to. I mean, it was, it, it, it was a school that not only was a great school, but also had majors in what they actually wanted to major in. I mean, it wasn't like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll go there, even though their engineering department sucks or something like that. It had everything that they wanted. And so it, w- it was the perfect, uh, you know, uh, matchup. And of course, you know, since we went f- to the same high school, there was always that 
common denominator there too. Okay. Well, since you're talking about that, so tell us about Oceana. Well, <laughs> Oceana was after we graduated. Uh, Steve and I got an apartment, which was, you know, not exactly our, actually it was a, it was an apartment, uh, but it was on the end of a runway at Oceana and we didn't know it because when we went in there to actually look at the apartment and, and sign the lease and stuff like that, there weren't any flights going on. I think maybe the landlord actually, you know, timed our appointment. So we, knowing exactly when the flight patterns were, so we wouldn't hear it. So the first day that we were in there moving in, uh, it was the part of the runway where the jets would sit and crank up their engines before they took off and the walls would shake. The noise was incredible. Uh, which, of course, limited the times which we could record <laughs> or have any fun playing because, you know, that stuff was that was deafening. I think so, I know the uh, the area you're talking about. That's miserable. It is. And it, it, it was a, it was a stupid thing on our part, but it was a perfect place for us to live. We we just we built it to suit ourselves uh, really, really nicely. Steve still had uh, was he went from uh, when he was at tech, he went from architecture into art and got into painting and got into um uh, uh, string artwork, which was really kind of cool. So we decorated the apartment. We built these wooden shelves and put all the tape decks and all the, you know, the outboard gear on there. And uh, uh, of course, the stereo and things of that nature. Uh, we had the entire living room area was dedicated as a studio. So we made as much room as we could in case anybody came over. And uh, also, we kind of continued a, a, a tradition that we had in the trailer. Uh, I like playing in, in low light. I mean, you know, I know on stage it's not that way, but I like the atmosphere of, of a quiet room when I'm playing my acoustics. And so Steve and I went out and over the years had accumulated a bunch of oil lamps, big ones and little ones. Some of them are no more than like two or three inches tall. And we positioned them on all the shelves and tables and stuff all over the place. And whenever we wanted to get into a session, we'd light them all and put just a little pinpoint of light on them. So there was like all this light. There was enough light to where we could see exactly what we needed to do. But the room was had a really nice atmosphere for, you know, playing and contemplation and listening afterwards. It was we just set it up for our own you know particular needs. Um, every once in a while, his younger brother, Todd, would come over, uh, especially uh, on um, on Sundays, which were the time that we set aside to, to actually really do serious playing because neither one of us would be working. Um, we started off by having um, breakfast together. We had Gus Burgers from the famous Gus Burger of Roanoke uh, and uh, had that and coffee and a shot of tequila and tuned up. And then we just went into it. So, <laughs> you know, that was our Sundays and it was, it was fun. It was a good place to be. Uh, Steve was uh, playing his Whirlister. I was uh, playing his acoustic guitars plus my ES-335. And when Todd came over, he had an ES-175 and a Les Paul, which he brought, which was, yeah, that was a pretty nice collection of instruments to start fooling around with. Yeah, and it we really had, was. Wow. Yeah. And we had his uh, TX uh, Sound on Sound, four-channel Sound on Sound tape deck uh, still with us and still in working order, which he bought in college and still had. So we were able to record almost every single thing that we did. Okay. Well, the tape deck you have been telling me about personally for a long time. Oh yeah. And if you're that young and you have that kind of, those kind of resources, you know, that, that leads places. And apparently it led somewhere with Steve. So tell us about where that took him as far as we're, you know, going from the trailer to a studio. How did that path happen for him? Well, the thing is, um, First of all, that that tape deck was a uh, kind of an inspiration. It was the same kind of model tape deck that the uh, Beatles used at Abbey Road to record uh, uh, the album Abbey Road. Right. Uh, so, so you know, it was it felt like you were working with something really, really good. Steve had uh, really wanted to concentrate on uh, his vocal work, uh, learning on how to actually uh, create harmonies. I mean, I sang along with him, but he wanted to use the deck to to develop his voice. He also wanted to use the deck to um, to put down different, I guess you could say, uh, keyboard parts. He, the, he had a Whirlister piano, but he also had an Arp Omni, which is more of a string uh, synthesizer, so to speak. And so being able to, you know, to, to record those particular instruments directly into the tape deck, but yet, you know, be able to get the, the best sound and, and audio quality out of it, it's, it's not just as simple as just plugging it in and going for it. I mean, there, there really has to be, uh, uh, as far as input and output, there has to be a you know a, a really 
it, there's not a science to it, but you know, through experimentation, you get the best sound. And so that was a big part of what he was doing. Of course, it offered up me to put down tracks on a channel or two. And also when Todd came over, I would allow for vocals and each, th each one of us, all three of us to have a channel for our, our, our instruments. So I mean, we put down a tremendous amount of original material. I can't tell you how much original material we have that of songs that basically we recorded just like that, but never ever uh, put into a professional studio setting, whether it was you know going to someplace like Earworks or the studios that we developed at this time. Um, uh, just for some reason, that never happened. But those, those, there's some really good songs in there. I can tell you that much. I believe it is. And really what I'm hearing is not only somebody that was trying to develop their voice, but really somebody that's really trying to develop a process. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, there were certain things that, that we, you know, simple basic processes that, that we learned over time. First of all, before you do anything, make sure your, everything is tuned up. Uh, you know, before you get into conversations, before you drink too much tequila, before you do whatever. Uh, you know, make sure that everything's tuned up and everything is working correctly. We were smart enough after a couple of big mistakes to, to make sure that we did that, which I think was important. But also, um, uh, there was, you know, that four channel sound on sound thing really, really amplified, I think, Steve's uh, lifelong, uh, I guess you could say, fascination with experimentation. I mean, you know, he could put down something that was very, very basic, and then he could take one of his other instruments, which he was always working on. He had a slew of instruments. We can talk about that later, I guess. But uh, he could also put those, in, uh, try on an instrument uh, or use that particular track that he played as a practice, you know, uh, I guess you could say template for the other instruments. Uh, so, I mean, that, that allowed him to explore his own musicianship in a lot of ways that I think that... Uh, uh, we've really seen, uh, especially with the professional recordings and the, uh, I guess you could say the more sophisticated uh, home studio recordings that we have, uh, he, is, he has mastered the art of strings, but that didn't come, uh, you know, overnight. That was a long, drawn-out process of not only finding out about orchestration, which he and I both learned together. Uh, he taught me an awful lot, uh, and we had some aha moments for orchestration that really paid off in the studio, but also... Uh, just the, the whole idea of once you now he's in the, in the position to where he has a fine collection of, of instruments and keyboards that he could generate the, the string sounds and orchestrations that he wants, he is really coming to his own. But that's had to start somewhere. And uh, with the TAC deck and the earlier studios and living it, uh, in the trailer in Oceano, those were the places where it started. That sounds right. Because anybody... I don't know. You just, as far as I'm concerned, you just can't get good without want to and want to leading to repetition. So I believe everything you're saying. Oh yeah. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve has always been, uh, you know, pushing for it, uh, pushing out the edge of the envelope for perfection. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things it's kind of a double-edged sword. He was into a lot of different instruments uh, over time. Uh, but also he had a lot of different home studios over time. And each one of those had a different resonant quality. Some were harder, some were softer. And of course, you know, if you're playing in a hard studio and, and you pull out an instrument like a, a violin or something, it's resonating off of everywhere. You need for something to suck up a, a little bit of that. However, when you're playing with a flute, uh, a flute can be a loud instrument too, but also, you know, it, the room itself would dictate a lot of times what instrument he would play or what instrument he would concentrate on over time. I can tell you at, at Oceana and at the trailer, uh, his guitar was his main instrument. There's no doubt about it. But the, 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 the beginning of the orchestrations with the, like the ARP Omni and the keyboard, uh, just proficiency on keyboards that he got you know, from uh, the Wurlitzer that he had uh, really paid off. Uh, but a lot of it had to do with the, the actual place that would, that would drive that, uh, I guess you could say, that, um, that practicing because it just seemed to fit better in that, in that location. Okay. So... Tell me about the transition between his first, well, I shouldn't say his first studio, because really his first studio was a trailer. Absolutely. And then y'all's apartment, that was the second studio. That's right. Like, take us through South Norfolk, Great Bridge, and General Booth. How did those, you know, how did the first one happen and the transition for the next two? Well, Stevie and I both got married. Uh, when he got married uh, to Vicky, um, they lived in South Norfolk for a while. And that was the basically upstairs in South Norfolk. <laughs> 
uh, that's where he decided to have his studio. Okay. And it was interesting because uh, it was like an upstairs room, you know, but it's like it was like an attic room where where it basically has slanted sides. Yeah. And yeah. and and what he had what he did was I thought was pretty cool. We experimented with that was the studio where we experimented with separation. What he did was between uh, you know about I guess about 3 to 4 feet. Uh he would actually build a uh, little into the to the roof and he's got the you know it's got the the insulation and everything there. But he would build uh a pieces of plywood that would section off half you know the that slanting part of the roof and uh, make it into a, like a little little teeny tiny room. And what he would do is he he wired that to where he actually had different speakers in each one of those things. I think there were four or five of them at different speakers, uh, you know, for different kinds of effects. And then we would place a microphone in front of that speaker, okay, and then shut the whole thing down. And so that particular uh, microphone would be picking up just that no no bleed over or anything. In other words, we experimented with exactly what microphones and what speakers and how separation can actually enhance the uh, the aspect of of a recording. And that was a really big thing because we hadn't had that luxury before. It was all okay, just set up a mic and and you know, we'll you know my, we could have two electric guitars being mic'd at the same time in the same room. Okay. And you know, so that there's no separation there. That's for damn sure. So I mean, so that was a real big, uh, I guess you could say, leap forward in terms of the, the importance of separation. Uh, uh, you know, as far as the instruments were concerned, especially if we were recording live. Otherwise, you know, we would be we'd be recording one instrument at a time on one channel of the tape deck. But at least that instrument was totally isolated, and there was no no overbleed from anything. Right. And, and, and also we could experiment with the different mics and the different speakers to see exactly which really, really worked the best. So South Norfolk was a, a really transformative kind of, uh, of, of, I guess it was, a, it was a step forward. We definitely kicked the can down the road a little bit in South Norfolk. When he and Vicky moved to Great Bridge, it was a much bigger house, much nicer house, and uh, he had an upstairs room. It's kind of like, like a, what, what normally would have been somebody's home theater room. And it had two closets, and he took those closets and turned them into sound booths. And so I can remember <laughs> we had some really nice moments there. One of the best moments we had was with David Edwards. David came over when I was working with him with Herndon Edwards to work on some of his original material. And he and I both got in one of the closets, and uh, and we put down three or four of the songs. One of the songs that we put down that particular day was that that stevie home studio closet version of say goodbye to me which uh that the harmonies were were spot on the guitar work was great uh the song is a wonderful song but you know it just we didn't have the mics record the way we wanted to but we we got it down and so in that studio we were able to record a lot of songs that would that would eventually become uh the songs that would, would go into the professional studios or what we would save until we got into our own home studio like say goodbye to me. It took me thirty years, thirty years before I got a home studio that was good enough for me to record the song, the that song, the way that I wanted it, and 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 honor David and give it to him as as a gift. You know, we had uh, me and Tanya and uh, on the vocals, except for one part when David chimed in a harmony. Donnie Satterwhite on pedal steel. I mean, you know, it was it was a great you know, experience, but it started in that closet, <laughs> in the closet, <laughs> in the closet. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, in his studio at Great Bridge. And there's a whole slew of songs, uh, both David's songs, my songs, Stevie's songs, which we recorded there, but never really, you know, fully processed. But the, um, the best and most, I guess you could say, uh, uh, productive was on, uh, Steve lived in, a, uh, I forget the name of the housing complex. It was uh, close to Nemo Church, and it was right off a of general booth. And we had this huge, gigantic upstairs room. As a matter of fact, the room was so big, it even had a second section, you know, a, a, a three or four steps up to get to an elevated spot in the room. That's where he had all his keyboards and the deck. And the rest of the room was just open for, let's set up our, you know, your mics or whatever the case might be. He hung, uh, he hung a, a performance speakers from his ceiling. It was a, one of those vaulted ceiling things. Right. And had, and had the studio speakers right up there in the close uh, proximity, you know, to the tape deck. And we, man, we recorded a lot there. Um, 
Uh, as a matter of fact, by that time he had uh, he had purchased a um, a, a TAC, uh sound, four channel sound on sound, but it was a cassette deck because basically he, we had, we had we had literally worn out his four channel you know reel to reel. So he got that, and we recorded uh, uh, a lot of stuff on there, a lot of experimental stuff. Um, now, is this a digital tape? No, no, it's not digital. It's it's, it's a, like you put in a regular cassette tape. Okay. Into this thing, and it, it records, uh, you know, four tracks on. Now the audio quality, you know, we only have so much, you know, bandwidth, so to speak, or uh, or I guess you could say uh, the magnetic, uh, you know, area on a cassette tape to actually right. record something. So it's not like recording on a big, thick, you know, inch wide or something like that, you know, piece of tape. But it, we we continued on with the with the four channel thing. We experimented with drum machines. Uh, that was the place where we experimented with. Uh, uh, reverbs, all kinds of reverbs, digital reverbs, uh, spring reverbs. I mean, it was like that was reverb time uh, at General Booth. But also, uh, we uh, we had Cam over and got a couple of really nice home recordings with Cam. And uh, that, but that still was our that was our Sunday time. Even South Nova, Great Bridge, General Booth, always on Sundays. We tried to make sure that we got together for the music. And and Steve was always generous, you know, with his time. Uh, with his instruments, uh, all the things that 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 really make for just not only a great personal but a professional collaboration, he was he was open to. And also by that time, I certainly had had gone the performance route. I was spending money on on um, recordings like the songs with album and stuff like that. We took into a professional studio and you know, calm before the storm. We were you know spending money on that. But while I was spending money on that plus performance stuff like PA equipment. For the bands and for solo, Steve spent his money and his time on uh, enhancing his home studio and also buying instruments that he could experiment with because you know that's still going on strong too. That's a good segue because you you mentioned it here and there. You mentioned the flute, and now it's just like okay, I want to know how many instruments does this guy play? I mean, legit play. Well, well, th- like I said, uh, that's a that's kind of a double edged sword. Um, Steve had the the wherewithal to be able to play them all. But, you know, anybody who knows about doing an instrument, unless you're a savant or something like that, which we are not, um, it takes a considerable amount of time and dedication to, to get your uh, skill set up on any instrument, no matter what. Right. Certainly his guitars, but also he had not, not only a, a six string, but he also had a 12 string, which I got news for you. If you think they're, that you play them the same, you're absolutely incorrect. That That's a whole different set of, of – uh, of approaches to an instrument, uh, you know, they're, they're very quite, quite different in the way that you play them. Right. Uh, the violin, uh, that goes back a long ways. That goes back to college. I can remember, you know, uh, with Steve would be fooling around, uh, with the, the flute and the violin in college more than anything else. Now he played the flute more than he played the violin. And to tell you the truth, uh, that really, he got really good on that. Not so much, uh, I guess you could say, well, he got good as a player. He could play it really well. But what he could create on the flute was um, was really something that was uh, really quite special. And the neat thing about a flute is that you can pretty much take it anywhere with you. I can tell you one story. We used to have a place that we used to love to go to. It was out in the, in the uh, past Newport, outside, off campus at Tech. Uh, we called it the coal mines. And what it was, it was this this rocky, bumpy dirt road that dead ended at an old uh, uh, coal mine. It was like one of those, you know, open mines, you know, right. like people just digging to a side of a hill. Right. But it was right beside a, a creek and you cross the creek and you went down this pathway until you got to this one spot. It was like a little ravine where there was a, a rock, you know, cliff that went up about at least 30, 35, maybe 40 feet. And then, you know, then there's the, there's the water. There's the creek there, but the, the creek actually, uh, there was two gigantic rocks, two gigantic flat rocks. I say they had to be at least, both of them, at least 15 feet in diameter. And the creek went down in between them and had a little waterfall there. Well, Steve and I went out there just to, just to hang out because we love to get out in nature a lot. And he brought his flute one time. And what he did was he went up on, he climbed, <laughs> he climbed up to the top of that cliff right next to, uh, to that little waterfall. I was down there, you know, drinking wine and, and just kind of kicking back and looking at the stars and enjoying it. And all of a sudden, this is like, you know, deep into the night, probably, you know, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. All of a sudden, I hear this sound of a flute just kind of wafting over. And it sounded 
absolutely incredible. Wow. I mean, you know, he he was he was on that night. I mean, he is really was on. And he it was the nature thing. It was the sound of the flute thing. It was water. It was outdoors. That was a perfect Steve experience. We had a lot of experiences like that from one uh, time or another. But that was that was a that was a, a a real, you know, that was an eye opener to me because it actually really showed me just exactly how, uh, uh, you know, something like an instrument like a flute, which is has a natural sound to it anyway, could be in the hands of somebody who really knew how to work with it, could be so uh, so beautiful and so effective as as an instrument. So the flute was a, a pretty cool thing. He, he as a matter of fact, he uh, um, did a great flute part uh, on Jody Lee Carroll. Um, it, it, I mean, you know, I just love the way that that he he flows along with with everything in Jody Lee Carroll with that.
violin. I can remember uh, there was another place that we lived. We didn't have a studio. Uh, it was uh, Chanticleer over near um, uh, Hilltop. And he had, he was, he had, he had gotten away from the violin, and then he picked it up again and he had this huge cavernous uh, living room. I'd be upstairs, you know, doing whatever. And uh, he would, there were, there were a few, you know, he, he learned or reestablished his, his skill set on violin, but it was painful. Uh, at that particular time because there's still a lot of squeaks and scratches going on and you know uh, he worked his way through them but at the end of the day you know that was that was that was a uh, that was a painful learning experience but the, the end result was absolutely beautiful okay um keyboards i mean he had the world through when we were living at, at oceana but then once he got to uh, general booth the whole world changed for him because he got an insonic sq80 Nice. which had all these uh, beautiful voices on there. And, of course, we added those voices into a lot of the recordings that we were doing. Right. And he had the EPS, uh, which was the uh, um, sequencer. Right. Uh, uh, you could do sampling on it, but that wasn't its, its bailiwick. I mean, it was a great sequencer. And, of course, you know, I would come over uh, uh, to, to General Booth. We'd experiment with it. Steve would let me, you know, get on the keyboard and see exactly how, you know, he would show me. I'd look over his shoulder. He'd show me exactly how to program it. And at the end of the day, that ended up being a monumental gift that he gave to me because uh, when we broke up uh, with Cam and that, that band went, uh, you know, all to the four, you know, the, the four winds just blew that one away. Uh, it was just me and Tanya left. And, but I knew from working with Steve and, and the sounds that he had showed me that, that this keyboard actually had built in, plus the fact that as far as sequencing, I knew that I could actually sequence a, a live act. I mentioned that I think, I, or yeah, Tony mentioned that on both episodes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, so that was learned at the General Booth Studio, and it was all about Steve because Steve had that there. He taught me how to do that, and uh, and so I, I I basically programmed a song, brought Tanya over to Steve's house, and said, "Listen to this." You know, it was a song. It was I forget what the cover was, but it's a cover of a song that we did. I said, "Now imagine." You know, you playing keyboards, me playing my guitar, and the unknown lead player, which eventually would be Jerry Herndon. You know, imagine us, you know, playing through this, okay? And I could actually take each one of those particular things, the kick drum, the bass, you know, the cymbals, the tom-toms, everything, and put it into a separate channel on the board so we could engineer it to where it could sound absolutely wonderful no matter where we play. Now, imagine that, and, you know, let's put ourselves a band together. And of course, Tony was was all over that. She was she was really behind that, and that would never have happened ever if it hadn't have been for Steve. Uh, Steve, you know, not only you know was generous with his time and also with the instrument, but also um, it was a learning moment for the both of us, which we both put to really good use. Wow, that's a lot. I mean, he, he had a lot to do with a lot in your oh, life. I that mean, you know, because I mean, if it weren't for that moment, who knows where y'all would have gone after that that first band broke up. Well, you know, especially after the energy that the band had. I mean, you know, uh, Playing With Cam had a lot of energy. We had a lot of, uh, a really a wide variety of of songs that we did. I mean, how do we find, you know, how, how do we take, you know, six or seven years worth of experience with that band and all of a sudden, uh, you know, start over again, you know, with, with, with new personnel? I mean, I didn't want to, I didn't feel like dealing with another drummer. Uh, because we had played with Steve for so long, uh, there was a lot of things that the keyboard just solved. Now it was it was I'll, I'll admit it was a risk because it does you know until you actually put a live acoustic guitar or two live acoustic guitars or an acoustic and electric and a keyboard and three vocals on top of all that, right? It, it can at times sound very mechanical, but you could also engineer it to where it blends. And it, of course, that was that was the objective, and I knew that I could do that if I just had the chance. But you know, that vision would have never been there if, if we hadn't been experimenting, or if I hadn't been experimenting with Steve and saw all the possibilities that we could actually use for that. Right. So, um, you know, there's uh, you know, there, there's just a, you know, it's just one of many things that that I owe him. I can, I you know, other things. For example, I was. Uh, I was playing with uh, Tanya and Vernon in Cimarron, and I forget what happened, but for some I, exactly what the circumstances was. Uh, but um, 
I ended up not having an acoustic guitar, you know, hard to play uh, uh, with, with, you know, an, an acoustic app without an acoustic guitar. Steve went out and bought me an acoustic guitar. He, it was a Penta. It was a low-end guitar, but it, it actually had everything that I needed in order to be able to keep playing in the group. It wasn't, it wasn't the instruments that I have now nor the instruments that he had, but he realized how important that was to me. And being a good friend, you know, my best friend, uh, he took it upon himself and he, you know, it didn't even bat an eyelash. I mean, just, we just, he just went out and we just did it. And, uh, I owe him, you know, so much for that because Cimarron wouldn't have been able to continue. We'd had a huge bump in the road. If, uh, if, you know, if I didn't have a guitar that I could actually perform with, there's, there's a lot of things. Plus, you know, like take the flute that he used to play. He also translated that flute playing into playing a recorder. And uh, you could also hear uh, the recorder on um, uh, Jerry Lee Carroll. You could hear the recorder on um, Sinking Feeling. I mean, Sinking Feeling shows you exactly, you know, Steve's creative and, and playing ability as far as the recorder is concerned. It sounds wonderful. Stop. 
got this sinking feeling of something lost and can't be found. I raise my hands up to your father. So I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that's in there that um, uh, uh, that was very very active at one time or another. Then you then you kind of slide off because how in the world do you keep up, uh, you know, studio quality chops on violin, cello, flute, keyboards, recorder, and two different guitars? It's impossible. Plus work, you know, there's only so much discretionary time that you actually have to devote to this stuff. I mean, plus you you know you have life issues, you have marriage, you have family, all the rest of that stuff. So eventually. What it boiled down to was he kept his guitar chops, he kept his keyboard chops, but the violin and the cello, he also played cello, which was also... Uh, I was going to ask you how, to, how that happened. Well, I mean, you know, he bought one, I don't know exactly what the circuit, when he was at uh, General Booth. And I'm not really sure about the circumstances as to why he bought it, but I know that um, a Yo-Yo Ma concert that he saw on television was was the thing that just tripped his trigger. He was okay. a Yo-Yo Ma, okay. he, to this day... Yeah, Yo Ma, Yo Yo Ma is like up there in the in the pantheon. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. So, uh, so I mean, so the it, it, the cello, I think, uh, really rounded out Steve's sense of orchestration uh, on a very personal level. I mean, he he did not master the instrument like he did his flute or his violin or his keyboards or his recorder, but he did. You know, when you have a cello sitting next to you and you have you just even if you're just hitting simple long notes. That whole thing resonates through your body. I mean, it it, there's, it, you know, there's just this great feeling when you uh, when you tap into the cello and it gives you that that sound that just you know makes your day. I think that that was a really big aspect of his development of orchestration, uh, not just about how it was supposed to sound, but also how it was supposed to feel. And if you engineer that into a recording, then if you play it well, which he does, uh, when he does his orchestrations, his, his string parts and stuff, I think that, you know, that really translates into something really, uh, really revealing about how good Steve is and how he got there, so to speak. Got it. Wow. That's a, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, it, but it, it, it's, it, it fits his character so much, uh, because, uh, <laughs> Uh, just like sinking feeling. I love that song, and it made it to the uh, the Renaissance Man album. But out of all this time, out of all these studios, out of all the collaboration and good times that we had, sinking feeling is the only, the only song that we actually have have completely produced, you know, to a point of a professional publication, and. The reason why, <laughs> the reason why is the fact that it's always something else. I want to try it at a different key. Let's see if we can take the tempo from 110 to 140 or take it down to 80. I mean, you know, the bottom line is, is like, I keep on telling him, you know, he, I, he gets tired of hearing, I'm sure you got to drive a stake and call it Texas. There's got to be one version. You know, you can perform all the other versions that you want. There's got to be one version that we go with. And so I, I was in love with that song for a long, long time. And, I, and so I said, look. I'm taking this version, I'm putting my guitar part on, I'm mixing it, this is what it's going to be, and it ended up being great. But, you know, I can tell you, there are, are there are a dozen versions before, and there are versions after, you know, that, that, are, that are, you know, that uh, just have a different feel and, and so forth. So, but that is a, a testament to his, his desire to experiment, and, uh, you know, I wonder what this is, or I wonder what that is. And, of course, that, you know, has opened up a lot of doors for me too. Well, my question to you is, is that kind of the downside of, of knowing a mad scientist? <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's not, a, it's not a downer. It's, it's never really been a downer 
there are sometimes, especially when he says, hey, why don't you, you know, put a guitar part to this and, and let's see where it takes us. And so I'll, I'll really, I'll, I'll get into it. I'll record it. It sounds really, really good. And as soon as I send it to him, by that time, he's on to another version. So, you know, to me, it's, you know, it, it, it could be a little bit frustrating, but at the end of the day, it's him. I mean, I, I can't, you know, I can't, you know, discount or in any way take away from, from the beautiful aspect of, of what that experimenting thing has done over the years. I mean, he still does it in so many different ways. A, a lot of people don't know it, but one of his great passions right now is creating um, three-bladed boomerangs. He designs them. They're about the size of a, of a Frisbee. He okay. designs them, and, and, you know, he's into the different wing shapes and lift and, and how it works in the wind. He gets into this stuff in a big way, and he's good at it. You know, he's, he's to the point now where he wants to buy a 3D printer so we can actually start making these things according exactly to the design that he has hand-shaped over the years. I mean, you know, he's into this kind of stuff in a big way. And, of course, he has changed his design on his on, uh, on his um, uh, boomerangs several times. But it is, you know, it's just his way. So it, it hasn't driven me crazy, uh, but it has kept us, I guess you could say, from finalizing things. But then again... You know, let's face it, folks. Uh, one of my biggest maxims in life is it's not the destination. It's definitely the journey. And, you know, look at all the great stuff that, that I have learned and have been able to uh, to, to move forward on uh, that basically started with my collaboration with him. Uh, he's, you know, plus he, uh, he, he does have a, a really good sense of humor. And whenever I'm saying, oh, man, come on, he, he would laugh it off. And uh, and so we, we just keep on going on because at, at the end of the day, we know that no matter what, um, uh, when we get together or when we when we, you know, swap off, you know, the latest and greatest recording or whatever, uh, I, I listen to what he has to say. Uh, he has great commentary. He asked me about different things. So what about this in the mix? What about that in the mix? And it has guided me over the years uh, so many different ways uh, to making sure that, um, you know, that all of our experimentation, uh, you know, for this particular song or that one has has actually paid off. Uh, even though I'm the guy that, you know, draws a line, drives the state, calls a Texas and moves on. Uh, all the, the things leading up to that point are just absolutely, uh, they're, they're conversations uh, that are so, I just can't even, I can't even put a, a, a measurement to it, uh, how important those things are. I hear you. Well, I will say this, I will admit this, I'm a big enough man to admit <laughs> that you are better than me because I am certainly, are we there yet, guy? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't know how long that would have lasted for me before, you know, it's like, man, come on. But that's what best friends do. And yes, I can that's appreciate right. that. I can appreciate that. Yeah. But and so what point in all of this does the basis for the songsmith start? Well, um, as far as the songs, um, a lot of the songs that were on the Songsmith album, uh, were, were started, you know, through collaborations with Steve and me. Um, and then eventually, you know, uh, got to the point where it actually, each one of those songs uh, had a composition to it and um, wanted to perform it. Uh, There's some songs that are definitely, uh, were big on the performance list, like um, um, Ballad of the Delta Lady, uh, Mangy Dog Blues, Jody Lee Carroll, Norfolk Days, 69 Pintmobile, all songs on that album we performed. Now, there were a couple, uh, like Snow Dance, uh, we didn't perform because they, it was an instrumental and, and it called for instrumentation that we didn't have at the time uh, for stage performance. But we definitely were into, uh, that was a, like a me and Steve and Todd generated kind of tune because Todd plays on that. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, that was not something that we actually could perform live. But, uh, but those songs, first we started performing them. And then after we started performing them, uh, we got some backers, uh, people who came around to, to actually listen to my solo act, um, had, had heard some of those songs, uh, being played with Cimarron and, um, those people, um, uh, I mentioned them before, uh, see, uh, uh, Sharon Kelly, uh, Charlie Scott, Pat and Bo Ludwig, uh, I owe them a lot because what they did was they allowed me, uh, to actually, you know, develop that album without, and have complete and total artistic ownership. 
They didn't have a, a thing to say about what went on in that artistically. They left all of it up to me. They put the money out there. We had a contract. We paid them back, you know, with interest. And um, so at the end of the day, um, the, the, the song started in the studio with Steve. They were polished. And at the actual, I guess you could say, compositions and um, arrangements, so to speak, uh, happened on stage. And then by the time we got into the studio, uh, everything was was actually pretty well squared away. There were a few things that, that, were, that were needed that were new. But I, pu- I pulled in people that I thought could actually do the job, and they did. So, you know, they were, they were just believers. You know, and you don't find believers like that. You know, I've seen so many people go out and, you know, hey, go fund me, you know, uh, you know so I can do my album. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they came to me and said, have you ever thought about doing an album? I said, yeah, I, I thought about it, you know, for years. And he said, well, you know, what kind of money is that going to take? And then the conversation just went on to, uh, to a business agreement. I, I think we were all proud of the project. And uh, I was certainly proud that we were able to sell enough albums to pay them back, you know, right. uh, which was, to me, a, a very, very important part of the process. Um, but, you know, uh, they loved the way it turned out and they loved the personnel that were on it. So, I mean, you know, uh, you know, that was uh, a very special people. That, yeah, that I, I wanted to make sure we talked about that because I remember the first time you told me and I think I had an image of people that, you know, like you said, had heard you and seen you and knew you had the goods, but they also had the goods too. I just That's right. that they had money um, because most people, you know, that aren't wealthy don't get, you know, uh, financing from their peers. They get it from someone who has cash. That's right. To know that you got back by your peers is a bigger story than I thought it was initially to start with. Yeah, so well, that's a big deal. Yeah, it is. And let's face it, you know, teachers are not exactly flush with a ton of cash. No. Uh, they did it because they believed in it. Uh, and and they believed in me enough to where, and they also realized that they didn't know Jack about uh, recording or the instruments and, and the process. So they left that all up to me. They trusted me to be able to, to uh, deliver a product that was worthy of the money and worthy of the time that they actually put into it. And I, you know, I've always appreciated that. And it also set a standard. I have never, I mean, we had a backer for the Calm Before the Storm album, uh, Kristen Phillips, but uh, we, uh, you know, it was the same situation. Uh, and uh, she was a believer, you know, uh, she, she she's a, a big part of the, uh, I guess you could say the, um, uh, she took videos and pictures of the groups that, that, that we had. And, uh, it was, you know, she just became part of, of, of the family, so to speak, as far as the music is concerned. So we've been lucky to, to have those intersections with people like her and Lloyd Stone, other people who was our light man and also just was, uh, helped me as, as far as, um, you know, loading in, loading out, just, just, a, just a good man. He and I are still good friends. Uh, so uh, I, I guess you could say um, just fortunate to have those people placed in my path. And we all need them because we don't oh, yeah. here by ourselves. We don't do anything that's left by ourselves. So, yeah, that's that's really good. And see, the real reason I really asked you this is to give the kind of, kind of give the audience a um, a lead in to the trip to Nashville, oh, which yeah. I've listened to the record. I listened to it today. Just kind of get refreshed. And I've listened to it before. And I like the mix. And I like the idea that the mix reflects the time in which it was recorded and it really represented the music that was recorded. So tell us about the trip to Nashville to get to Quadraphonic Studio to get this mixed, which is not, that's something else that's a big deal. You're talking about a local guy going to the big city to get this done. Oh, yeah. So tell I, us about that. Well, I mean, I think that one of the, the largest share of the money did not go uh, to Live Oak Studio for the recording. I mean, we paid them good money to get in there and record the tracks. But, you know... Right now, I, I did a little like inflation study. We paid $150 an hour to go into Quadraphonic Studios in 1982. That translated now would be over $500 an hour studio time. I mean, when you think about it, that's that's a, a huge, gigantic chunk of change for back in 1982. Absolutely. Uh, and, but I had talked it over with Steve. And one thing that uh, Steve and I also listened to a lot of music, a lot of covers, which are not our own. And he was just as much of a Fogelberg and Jimmy Buffett and Neil Young fan as I was. And those those people had recorded at Quadraphonic. And so 
they not only have the gear, but they're, they're you know, you, you go into a studio, well, even today, you wouldn't go in and, and to record an acoustic album uh, in a studio that was known for doing rap or hip hop or heavy metal. I mean, because the engineers there are, are keyed on a particular kind of sound and, and develop their studio along those lines. The studio at Quadraphonic, which sorry to say is no longer there, was exactly what we needed. And so, um, I, I, so once it was finally finished at, at Live Oak with uh, Steve Peppis and Jim Michaels, Steve and I took the tapes, uh, the, the two-inch uh, you know, recording tapes, to, to Quadraphonic, and they hooked us up with a man by the name of Willie Pavere. Uh, Willie Pavere was uh, was not their 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 number one engineer. Uh, he was he was a, a formal engineer on their engineers list, but he wasn't the guy that would record Dan Fogelberg or, or Neil Young. But he was for some reason I don't know whether they he was just uh, young and hungry like we were. He was the perfect engineer because he not only understood me and understood the songs, he understood Steve as well. And Steve had some input on on that as far as just. You know, because after, we didn't get it all mixed in one day. It took us three days to actually take care of it, with about maybe four or five hours per day in order to be able to take care of all of it. But um, so Willie was very much, he won Steve's heart over immediately because he was he was very much into experimenting. Like he would take uh, uh, a, a simple uh, uh, uh studio trick he would take the track of steve uh, my, my brother-in-law's uh, snare drum and put it into uh into uh, an amplifier and uh the amplifier speaker he put on top of a snare drum and so basically he would get the signal from steve's snare drum but it would actually hit on another snare drum to give it a little bit of a little bit a different sound a little fullness just for one track you know in other words just for one song not for every song but just one because he wanted something a little bit fuller than what he had to work with Little things like that, little voiceovers. Willie was definitely into it. Plus, Willie, Steve, and I had the chance to uh, to spend time with Willie. You know, outside the studio, we had him over to the, to the, the hotel room. We sat around with you know pizza and beers and and just talked way into the night, uh, so we could understand each other a little bit better, which we really enjoyed. And uh, I took the rental car one day, and Steve and I just drove around Nashville. Uh, Nashville at, at that time in the early 80s was a different city than it is right now. And it was a real interesting experience, especially for a history guy. I mean, there was a music history there, but also uh, it's known as the Athens of the South. I never understood that until Steve and I are cruising by in our, in our rental car and look off to the right. And there is a full sized replica of the Parthenon from, from Athens, Greece. In sitting in the, in the sitting in the center of their city park. Wow. I was stunned. I was a world history teacher. I was stunned. I said, we got to get into this, man. So we pulled over there. It was this huge, gigantic park. People out there on picnic blankets, throwing frisbees, you know, dogs and stuff like that. And it was, you know, inch for inch, a, a carbon copy. Not a carbon copy, but uh, it was a full scale um, building of the, of the Parthenon in Athens, Greece. Wow. And, you know, so so I thought to myself, you know, well, they got Vanderbilt there. And that's, of course, a real academic thing. But, I mean, when you think about a, a city that is so much known for its music, but a community that would put that much time and that much money to have something like that built, you know, because the Athens of the South is was their one of their, you know, I guess you could say uh, claims to fame in terms of the names uh, associated with the city. Uh, that was really something pretty cool. Uh, so that you know, so the experience of actually being around stuff like that in Nashville really kind of solidified everything for us. Uh, Steve was right there with me every single step of the way. Uh, Willie was nice enough to where uh, when he was mixing or when we were doing something, he would have two seats in there along the board, one for Steve, one for me. Uh, they, I can remember they used Studer equipment, which was uh, very, very Studer boards and Studer recorders. Uh, Studer was a really big name back then. And uh, so we got a really, really, we had good gear that we were, uh, that we were actually, you know, doing the process with. And then Willie and, and the studio said, uh, why don't you send this? We want to send this over to Randy Kling. Now, people don't know who Randy Kling is. Uh, they don't know mastering. Randy Kling mastered everybody. He mastered Michael Jackson. He might mastered Billy Joel. He mastered Elvis Presley. He mastered everybody. And it just so happened he was available. <laughs> so him and Jim Lloyd, 
mastered that album after the fact. I mean, you know, we went uh, home and they actually, you know, sent us the the, the final mastered uh, thing on cassette and on album so we could actually, you know, proof it to, to see if it was what we wanted. And so that whole experience, you know, but Steve and I actually sat through that every single every single minute together and we're able to soak up all of that because, you know, Steve is not only a player, Steve is an engineer. I mean, I engineered him, he engineered me, uh, and, and we picked up an awful lot by being with Willie in Nashville at such a prominent studio with such good gear. It, you know, it also showed us, you know, some of the things that we knew that we had to get into. Like, we knew we had to start getting into uh, better microphones if we're going to actually reach the sound that we want. Steve was, was uh, being the engineer guy, uh, you know, was the person who actually went out and 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 put up the money, you know, to, to buy the, the really nice mics eventually. But I didn't slack off on it either. I bought us Buyer M500s, which were ribbon mics, which was unheard of for a performing group because they're so easily damaged if you don't take good care of them. You can't throw them around like, you know, uh, you know, a rock star, you know, swinging around on the end of a, of a, of a you know, a mic cord. I mean, they're, they're delicate, but they're also very rich for the kind of acoustic vocals that we had. And Steve and I used them in the studio some, too. So it was, it was a real learning experience for us, but really enjoyable because, you know, that was time that we had together that it was just us focusing on music in, in one of the absolute best places that you could be if you were an acoustic or an acoustic rock musician at that time. And that's 82. That's, you know, next year, that's 40 years ago. Uh, and, and, you know, we had had years of, of uh, you know, fooling around and tinkering around with our, our home studio stuff. But I think that experience for the both of us really cemented a tremendous amount of confidence and education and just motivation. Uh, to, it, it, you know, a lot of stuff that, that Willie had that he tried uh, and, and we did while we, while we were there that we took home and tried once we got home. And, uh, and so... You know, it was, I you know, it was it was a it was a great trip, and I'm really glad that he was there with me because it was the it could only be that way, you know, to go there without Steve just wouldn't have been the same. It wouldn't have been right. It just, you know, it just wouldn't. So I'm I'm glad he was there with me, and I think we both really learned from that an awful lot. Nice, and you're right. It's just some things just won't be the same or wouldn't ever be without certain people. That's for sure. Well, I mean, you can, you can see the, you know, you can see across the river to the other side, you know, and, and you know, what's there, you know, I, I knew that I wasn't going to have a, a, a 24 track, uh, you know, Studer deck with, 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 you know, six subs and all the rest of that kind of stuff. I knew I'm going to have that, but I also knew how to, to actually work the, the effects and the EQs and, and the volumes and the blending and mixing and, and so forth. And also once you finally get into uh, digital recording, you know, on the computer where you can have you know, multiple tracks, uh, a lot more than, than, than all that just kinds of, uh, kind of just settles into, okay, I now have everything that I need to do what I want. And that's the reason why, you know, over the years, uh, Steve and I have both, you know, learned uh, to, I guess you could say, take advantage of every little technological thing that we possibly could that happened to come along at the time. And once we fart, you know, once we started, uh, uh, you know, recording on computers and using DAWs and stuff like that, then uh, we were not only able to do it at home, you know, in a, in a much more sophisticated home studio situation, we were able to share that, you know, we could send waveforms or tracks back and forth to each other. We could send, uh, you know, this is the latest as, as an MP3. What do you think? And we, we didn't have to be living together in order to be able to continue our love and our passion for collaborating and creating music together, which, you know, uh, what, once those things actually happen, once that technology opens up to you, uh, all the possibilities, then we took advantage of it because we already knew we already had a process down pat. We just expanded that process to take in, um, I guess you could say our time away from each other, uh, which of course, when we got together and, and, uh, uh, were able to do things, uh, you know, in terms of recording and stuff like that together in the same room, it, whether it's his home studio or mine. Oh, well, that was that was a juice. We had a great time doing that. Um, well, for example, uh, you know, uh, on the Over the Falls album, 
that was the first album that I did out of the home studio, my home studio. But, you know, all the tracks that I did, I didn't record them all, didn't record myself. I was out in the hallway with my microphone and headphones as Stevie was in the room, you know, with uh, with the deck, you know, or not with the deck, but with the computer recording me on those tracks. I, that album would have never happened if it wasn't for Steve. Right. So, uh, you know, there those kinds of things, uh, you know, he got, we all got better at what we did. We got better at playing. We got better at at, uh, at engineering. We and of course the experimentation isn't just with instruments. You experimenting in the studio uh, with engineering uh, can bring a tremendous amount of of I guess you could say creative. Uh, I guess what's the word I'm looking for? It's not just creative moments, but uh, an actual final product which you never believed would have been uh, would have been possible if you didn't actually take the time to, well, let's just try this and see if it works. I mean, I don't have, in my studio, I don't know what people think about when they think about a home studio. I do not have a boatload of gear. I don't. Uh, what I do have are great microphones, great instruments, and uh, and a way that I could actually record them. Uh, you know, but as far as like compressors and gates and limiters and all of that i don't have any of that hardware i mean i got i got plugins and stuff like that but at the end of the day you know i i try and keep it as simple as possible uh because i you know i've i've found and this is one thing that stevie taught me as well if you got a great instrument uh, best to get out of its way and just let it let it do its thing you know don't try and you know really impress upon it uh especially an acoustic guitar or or a square neck dobro or something like that if the instrument is 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 a fine instrument, it will it will do all the work for you. <laughs> yes, if you just let it, you yes. know. If you yes. just let it, and the way that you can let that happen is that you have the the right situation and the right microphones to record that. Well, you and I know that from uh, doing um, uh, our better angels. We tried a new microphone configuration uh, for that, and in one take, boom, there it was. Acoustic, you know, vocals and, you know, uh, guitar. And it, is a, it was a new sound and, and it was a, a great moment. It was a great recording moment. And, and so, you know, some people say, well, I only record with this. Well, I wanted a new sound for my acoustic guitar. Right. And you gave that to me uh, because, you know, we were both willing to, to really to take the setup, really take the time and, and see what could come of it. And it, it worked. And those are the kinds of things which I look forward to in the future because it's part of it's part of my schooling. It's part of what actually happened when I worked with Steve. It's always been that way, and so you know, as long as as long as I'm not you know getting to be a old curmudgeon or something like that, it was this way or the highway. You know, as long as there is that that spirit of experimentation, which I owe totally to Steve. Um, then there will always be some really great recording moments. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Truth, because without that kind of attitude, you, I mean, great moments just can't happen. That's right. They or at can't. least it can't be repeat. That that process can't be repeated. You're absolutely but, right. Uh, yeah, because you'll have an you'll have a happy accident, but that's about all it'll ever be. Because yeah. being stuck in your ways in any kind of way is generally not that good. So, no, it, it's 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 a death knell uh, when you when you actually get to the point where you 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 can't see that, that that there are possibilities uh that are beyond what you know what you had i mean i i could have gone and played the same kind of 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 rhythms or same kind of instruments or use the same kind of mics or the same people over and over again i mean all of them i've recorded with i love dearly but at the end of the day what bringing in i guess you could say not only new songs but but new instruments and new I guess you could say approaches to the song itself, which only comes from collaborating with people who also are of like mind. Uh, I told the story about uh, recording with Greg. I asked him to, 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 to maybe work up a guitar part. He brought in a mandolin because he knew that that song was made for mandolin, something I didn't know because I had never played with anybody on stage or even recorded in a studio. I'd never played with a mandolin before. Right. I mean, with all the acoustic experience, that sounds kind of weird, but it's the truth. But he knew. And, and of course, you know, I was open to experimenting. If, if he thinks it's the best thing, I trust this guy because I know the magic we can make if things happen. And it happened. So 
that kind of mentality does not come overnight. I owe all of that to Steve. I also owe it all to, uh, well, a good portion of it to Tanya for allowing me not only to have the time, but also the resources at the time to, uh, to make all of it happen. I mean, let's face it, we might have had backers for the albums and stuff like that, but, you know, she knew it was time, she knew it was, it was money, and she knew it was important uh, to, to make sure that we actually did everything right. And she, she was willing to go with it. And so I, I owe her a lot as well. I mean, you know, all of you out there who, have, uh, who are playing music and have wives or significant others, if you have that, and you know, as part of your scenario, then uh, God bless you because, you know, it is a rare thing. Uh, lots of times it does not work out that way at all. Truth. So are there any other contributions, uh, you know, recording wise throughout this history between y'all two that jumps out at you that you haven't mentioned? Well, um, I mentioned the engineering at Over the Falls and uh, the flute and stuff on Joe Lee Carroll. Um, Steve and I, way back in, when we first graduated from college, my parents uh, went out to California and I had Steve uh, come over uh, while they were gone. We set up uh, the tape deck in our living room. We sat around and played, just randomly played a whole bunch of stuff. But the intersections, there were a few over about a two or three hour period that really we liked because we got them on tape. So we listened back to it. We said, that sounds good. Let's work on, on polishing that up. And so between the two of us, we have a, a really nice dual finger picking style that blends really, really well. Of course, that all is, is accented or accentuated uh, by listening to Fogelberg and people like that who actually do those kinds of things. So that gave us a, a way of kind of keying in on how to engineer it. But uh, on the um, we, we've done several things. There are two songs on uh, the Renaissance Man that uh, that really, I guess you could say, really showcase that. One is his song, Sinking Feeling. Um, and the other is about the giving. Uh, I think about the giving is is really probably one of the best uh, dual finger picking songs that we that we've ever done. There's basically uh, uh, dual finger picking acoustic guitars, uh, a vocals, a background ooze, and and a little lap seal uh, accents on that song. And but it it sounds absolutely wonderful. It does. some things at the grocer and you move my table and chair I've been calling every five minutes can you see I'm losing my hair oh my I'll be sure to get your medication Save some time for touches and smiles Say the words that make a conversation I will push this wheelchair for miles It's never about the hours Cherish the time you share It's sometimes about the giving But always again Hard to keep anything down. A schedule full of appointments. I'm so tired of running around. Yes, I am. So many things to consider. So many. But I wake up praying and hoping And it's all because you are here Yes, it is I'll 
I'll be sure to get your medication Save some time for touches and smiles Say the words that make a conversation I will push this wheelchair for miles It's never about the hours Cherish the time you share It's sometimes about the giving But always the care It's never about the hours Cherish the time you share It's sometimes about the giving But always the care Always the care And um, uh, in terms of communication, um, I uh, I took uh, I used loops a lot uh, for for some of the stuff, drums and bass and stuff like that. But I started experimenting with with uh, keyboard loops, uh, royalty free stuff, you know. But still, very very high end um, studio quality loops. And so I created a piano part, which uh, I said, "There's only one thing that this thing needs." Um, and that's, that's strings. It needs string, a string part to go over with it. Just those two instruments or those two uh, sounds together. So I sent it to Steve and I said, look, man, I, all I want you to say, the song is moving on. It's all about friends who move away that you don't see anymore face to face or people who have passed on. Um, that's the feeling that I want. And about, you know, after, you know, three or four different tries, you know, he says, I think this is it. And he sent me uh, a string composition, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It, it convinced me that, you know, even though a, a lot of string stuff we had done in the past, uh, you know, I find myself wanting you, Calm Before the Storm, all those kinds of songs had strings in them. This one was the, was without a doubt, it was, it was I consider it his masterpiece in terms of uh, just the composition of it all. As a matter of fact, I, before I actually started doing it myself, I actually sent songs out to be licensed by other things like Pond Five and uh, you know Getty and all the rest of those people. Uh, Moving on is the is the only song that has actually uh, been picked up uh, for people to use in their their commercials and stuff like that. It was picked up by two different people. Uh, they uh, bought it off of, of Pond Five. Uh, so. Uh, out of the tens of thousands of possible, you know, or piano and string arrangements, uh, two people found that to be, you know, great stuff.
So, I mean, that thing that speaks well for itself. And uh, uh, his uh, working on, we're working on a string part right now. Well, he's already got it. I'm waiting for, uh, I'm going to get together with Donnie Satterwhite to put a final uh, pedal steel track on it. We're doing an instrumental version for the new EP uh, coming out later on this summer, early fall, uh, of I'll Remember, which is a wonderful, you know, melody and, and, and I guess you could say compilation uh, or uh, collaboration uh, with me and Pete Schonard, uh, who plays Kungas. And um, uh, basically, uh, it, we killed all the vocals. And uh, I said, Steve, I want you to uh, put a string part to I'll Remember. And what he came back with was stunning. And I can't wait to get Donnie's recording on there of, of his pedal steel to round that off. It'll be a wonderful instrumental. And, you know, that's just part of the process. It just keeps on moving on with us. Well, we've gone through 40 years with one person. So in your opinion, what is your take on that relationship? Uh uh, you know, outside of Tanya, I know of no one who who I feel closer to, who knows me better. Um, I love him like a brother. Uh, he's, uh, you know, I'm also connected with his family. Uh, I knew his father and mother really well. Uh, I know his brothers. His, his brothers, uh, you know, are are uh, have always been incredibly supportive of what I'm doing with my music or what Steve and I have done with the music. Uh, so there's a family connection there. Uh, Tanya loves Stevie. I mean, if there's any time, you know, uh, even if we're at our busiest, you know, if Steve has a chance to come over, she's always happy to see him. Uh, uh, we don't get together as a foursome with our, with Vicki, uh, as much because Vicki's in real estate and she, man, she works all the time. But at the end of the day, um, I cannot think of a, of a relationship that I've had in my life that, uh, it means more to me or is as proven in terms of not only friendship, but also uh, creativity and production, uh, more than Steve. Uh, and uh, he's, he's a benchmark for me, and I, I would not be able to, to have the life that I have as a musician without him. That's what it's all about, man. And um, everybody doesn't get to have that opportunity. I'm glad you got it. Well, I appreciate you, you know, give me the chance to to actually, you know, put it out there and let people know him a little bit better. Uh, I hope they enjoy the songs that we that we've chosen uh, in order to be able to to see exactly, you know, his his range and and his development over time, uh, in terms of um, uh, as a musician and as as a creative songwriter. But um, yeah, he's he's a special man, and um, I look forward to the time when he retires, and all we have to do, you know, is. Uh, any time of the day, just give each other a holler and, uh, you know, uh, be able to really even get into it even more, even at, at this late stage of the game, so to speak. Understood. Understood. This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick, edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. And a big thank you to Silent Voices International Radio for having us. On behalf of Tom, this is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken. Music.